Hello and welcome to sentencingstats.com, the premier website for federal sentencing statistical data and analysis. I'm Mark Allenbaugh. It is March 8, 2019, and today I'm going to provide a comprehensive statistical analysis of Mr. Manafort's 47-month sentence that he received yesterday evening in the Eastern District of Virginia from Judge Ellis. Uh, first, I want to point out a couple of uh, anomalies. Uh, obviously, uh, as being commonly reported in the press, a lot of people are surprised by the leniency of the sentence. And as I'm going to discuss, uh, it, it is very low, statistically speaking. Uh, but of course, with statistics, it depends on what you're comparing his sentence to. Uh, and we'll see that under some measures, it's not as low as one might think. Uh, but needless to say, there is something very odd, regardless of its length, about a 47-month sentence. And that is the 47 months per se. Uh, and the reason why I'm pointing this out is, obviously, one wants to know whenever a judge imposes a sentence, why that particular sentence, as we all expected, and as is very common under the sentencing guidelines, judges frequently nowadays impose sentences below the guidelines, sometimes significantly below the guidelines. Although, as we're going to see, this was a record variance below the guidelines. But nonetheless, everyone figured and everyone anticipated that Mr. Manafort would receive a below guideline sentence. I had predicted in the realm of around 15 years because of how high his guidelines were. And again, the bottom of his range was almost 20 years, 235 months. So, but why 47 months as opposed to 48, 46, 60 months, you know, let alone 180 months or 15 years, which again is where I thought he would come out. But 47 months is really weird for this particular reason. Here is, a, uh, here is the uh, sentencing guidelines chart, the table as we call it. And as you can see here along the left-hand side, there are the offense levels, one through, f one through 43, and various criminal history categories depending on the amount of criminal history the defendant has from one, meaning none to little criminal history all the way up to six. So we also, we, as we know, Mr. Manafort's final offense level was at a 38 and he was in criminal history one, so his sentencing range was 235 to 293 months, as I have outlined here. What Judge Ellis did, though, in, in reducing his sentence is he picked a very weird number, not a unique number, but a weird number, because generally when judges uh, impose a sentence, whether it's a departure or within guidelines or what have you, they usually pick the bottom of a guideline range. So, for example, like 63 months or 57 months or 46 months, for example. And this happens to be the range. Arguably, he could be in a 22. But for my purposes, I'm going to say that Judge, Judge Ellis, what he effect, effectively did was pick um, an offense level of 23. He went down from a 38 to a 23, a 15 level reduction. But why not give him a 46-month sentence, which is at the bottom of that range? Or a 57-month sentence, which is at the top of the range? Or a sentence right in the middle? Usually, again, the, the, the way it breaks down when federal judges are imposing a sentence using this table, they usually do one of three things. Either the bottom of whatever range it is that they finally settle, settle on, or they impose... Uh, uh, months that correspond to a whole year. So, for example, 48 months would have been four years, and that makes sense, or 60 months for five years or what have you. And then third, uh, they'll pick uh, the top of the range. Uh, sometimes they're not going to go, uh, they, they may find him that he's a, you know, a, at a 24 and give him a 63-month sentence or something like that. Uh, and finally, actually, not three, but four, fourth, uh, the fourth iteration is they'll pick exactly in the middle of the range, you know, wherever that, uh, that midpoint might be. Rarely, rarely do they ever pick a, uh, a, a term or a, a, a particular month that doesn't fit into one of those four categories. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've never seen that. I've never experienced that uh, myself. So I went and I looked at the statistics, at the data. 
Now here at sentencingstats.com, we have the data on nearly 1 million federal defenders sentenced under the guidelines from 2006 through 2017. Uh, 2017 is the latest publicly available data files. The Sentencing Commission has not released its 2018 uh, data file as of yet. So looking at all, all this data, nearly a million defendants, what I did is I broke down how many people received a sentence of 41 months, for example. And this was regardless of whatever uh, uh, offensive conviction they had, whatever guideline they had, whatever... Uh, their uh, criminal history was, whether there was a mandatory minimum or consecutive, regardless of any of that. Just how many at the end of the day got 41 months. And 41 months is interesting because 41 months is, even though it sounds like a weird number, 41 months is the bottom of, you just pick this here, 22. At the bottom of the range for an offense level 22. And a lot, 11,000. I mean, not, not a lot overall in terms of compared to a million, but a lot. Nonetheless, 11,488 is a lot of defendants that got 41. 42 months drops off significantly. Well, you know, 42 months uh, doesn't correspond to the bottom or the top of any range, but what 42 months actually happens to be is, uh, if I'm doing the, the, the math correctly in my head, it's three, exactly three and a half years. 36 months is three years, plus six is 42, so three years, six months, and that kind of makes sense. And that's generally, you know, judges, of course, are humans too, and we always want to try to pick something uh, that either a whole number or uh, a particular fraction. There have actually been psychological studies on this regarding sentencing, believe it or not, where judges seem to be compelled or have a psychological anchor to a whole number or a, a particular fraction, like a half. So three years, three and a half years, four years, et cetera. Um, or if there's a guideline range like we have, bottom of the range, top of the range, or the middle of the range, but not somewhere like uh, one month above the bottom of the range as we have here. That's very odd. And so here, 43, it's a weird, it's a weird one. Uh, it's not the bottom or top or middle of the range, and there's only 40. And it's not, um, for example, like three and a half years. It's three years, seven months. So not a lot of people receive that. And so... Uh, let's kind of cut to the chase. Here is what Manafort received, 47 months. Only 450 defendants received that, which is really interesting because if, you, if, uh, if Judge Ellis had gone one month less, you'd see very common, 46 months. Why did so many people get 46 months as opposed to 47? Well, it's very easy. 46 months is at the bottom, is at the bottom of the range. And why did so many people, you know, nearly 19,277 received 46 months and 12,682 received 48 months? Why, 40, why so many in 48, not 47? Well, 48 months is four years. Again, makes sense when one understands the psychology and where these numbers come down and where, where they fit on the, um, the sentencing table. So the reason why I think this is important, I'm spending some time on here, is just statistically and by the structure of the guidelines, it seems rather arbitrary. Where did that number come from? What is the significance of 47 versus 46 versus 48, or frankly 49, but not a lot of people got 49. A lot of people got 51, 51 months. Why do they get 51 months? Because it happens to be at the bottom of have <laughs> a particular offense level. So, and the reason why I think this is significant, too, is not only, of course, is it shocking how low this sentence is, but where it landed. And that may speak to some type of arbitrariness here. And judges, federal judges tend not to be arbitrary. Uh, even though we might sometimes think they are, they're not. So I am very interested in finding out what the rationale was. I don't know if this was articulated in Judge Ellis's, um, during the sentencing hearing yesterday. I'm looking forward to reading the transcripts. I haven't got my hands on them yet, but I certainly will. But I, I am dying to know what that, what that 47 month, why 47 months as opposed to 46, 48 or any other particular number. And by the way, that I also thought, well, how maybe it has maybe it's a function of the degree of the downward 
variance. Because again, as we know, Manafort's, uh, the bottom of his range was 235 months, okay? Well, the bottom, the difference between 235 and 47 is 188 months, which is 15 years, eight months. Okay, so what? <laughs> There's that number did straight. Maybe if it was an even 15 years, if maybe the thought was, I'm going to chop off 15 years, okay, then that might make sense, or 10 years, or 20 years. But 15 years, eight months also doesn't make sense. It's a, it, you know, it's a weird number. It happens to be a bottom of a range here, but that's kind of neither here nor there. Um, it's the difference between the bottom of this range and what he actually received, which was 47 months. So that, they just want to leave this with the audience that there is something weird about a 47-month sentence, aside from the fact that it is so low. So now let's look at terms of where it lands. You know, how low is it? Well, as it turns out, <coughs> the guideline, excuse me, <coughs> the guideline that Manafort was sentenced under was 2S1.3, which is a financial crime one for his, it's kind of a combination of his tax and money laundering. It's not, it, it's a, a relatively seldom used guideline. It's not rarely used, but, but seldom used. Uh, uh, it's not, for example, is uh, used as 2B1.1, which is the general fraud guideline, or 2S1.1, which is the money laundering guideline. Um, but it's been used enough. As we're going to see, it's been used over 3,000 times, or people, it, over 3,000 individuals have been sentenced under it. And as it turns out, this 188-month downward variance, which is exactly what he received, is 180-month downward variance, is unprecedented under this guideline. Now, that might strike somebody initially as, oh my gosh, this is a very significant finding. Um, and it is, but also it isn't. Uh, and the reason why is this. Most people that are sentenced under, and this, by, by the way, this is a little bit of inside baseball. I try to put this together quickly. This is just a snapshot of some of our data, of uh, a, a, a spreadsheet that we use. What this is showing you here uh, on all these crazy numbers, just trust me on this, is how many individuals have been sentenced under 2S1.3 overall. There's been 3,123 individuals sentence. And, and again, not necessarily with the same offense level. As a matter of fact, most didn't have anywhere close to the same offense level as Manafort, which again was 38. You know, and, or, or the criminal history. This includes people that had criminal histories 2, 3, 4, etc. Some of them may have had mandatory minimums and whatnot. This is, in short, this is just everybody, regardless of offense level, criminal history category, mandatory minimum, etc. So there was 3,124 between 2006 and 2017. The average sentence under this guideline was only 10 months, 10.7 months, and the median was only just, just a hair shy of six months. So what's really interesting is the 47-month sentence, this is a little shorthand here, is in the 97.1st percentile. So interestingly enough, Manafort's sentence of 47 months under 2S1.1 was very high very high. Uh, that's not to say that necessarily anybody should take solace in it if they felt that Manafort didn't get his just desserts. Um, but what really what it indicates is most people that are sentenced under this guideline, their offense conduct is significantly less serious, period, regardless of the sentence imposed, just significantly less serious uh, as the guidelines are calculated. You know, they're not their offense conduct, for example, isn't going to involve tens of millions of dollars like Mr. Manafort's did. So, uh, so that I, I just point this out because Mr. Manafort at an offense level 38, there have only been three individuals out of these uh, 3,000 that had a higher offense level under 2S1.3 than Mr. Manafort. So that now it doesn't, it's not so surprising that his 180 month downward variance is unprecedented. It's unprecedented because almost nobody sentenced under this guideline has an offense level 38. Again, only three. Only three individuals did out of 3,000. So uh, that, I think, may, uh, I'm not sure which way that cuts. Depends on which side of the fence you're on and, and in terms of how uh, you view the 47-month sentence. 
But nonetheless, it is, it, it's a significant finding that, um, and here basically is the finding cutting to the chase again. Uh, what this 76 indicates is that is the largest downward variance ever imposed under 2S1.3, that is, until last night when Manafort received a 188 month downward variance, uh, over twice the previous record. Um, and just to, just to hammer this point home, that is significant per se, but it's also one must just keep in mind that the reason why his variance is so significant is because very few people uh, were had an offense level as high as he did. Only three had higher, only three had higher since 2006 to 2017, which is also significant. So uh, the point being is that Manafort was a very serious and unusually serious, high very highly serious offender under this particular guideline. Okay, so Here's something, and another interesting finding. The 47-month sentence, however, is less than half of what similarly situated cooperators would have received. And so let me explain the similarly situated, uh, what that phrase means. Under the guidelines, the purpose of the guidelines has always been since 1986 when they were introduced and they went into effect in 1987, is to, to the, the best of the government's ability, the best of the federal judiciary's ability, try to impose similar sentences on those with similar offense conduct and similar criminal histories. And what the guidelines do is they take into consideration many common factors and give them a weight. Judges plug all, make these findings a fact, then determine under the guidelines how much weight to give them, you know, plus three levels, plus four levels, minus two levels, et cetera. They come up with that calculation and that gives you a final number, which is the total offense level. You find also the criminal history category, and you, you, you look at the uh, sentencing table uh, again here, and once you find the final number and the final criminal history category, then that gives you your sentencing range. These are just advisory. Uh, courts are, uh, are advised to just use these as a starting point on whether to go up or down, and the facts of the particular case can help uh, drive the judge how far down or how far up or just whether to follow the particular particular guideline. But at any rate, so what, what I did here is obviously I can't look at people that are identically situated to Manafort because as it turns out, again, his guideline was 2S1.3. There were only three other individuals. It happens to be these three individuals right here uh, that had an offense level of uh, 38 or higher. And you can't make any statistical inferences off of just three cases. So what I decided to do is, is broaden this. And by the way, uh, this last sentence here of 60 months, that particular individual was subjected to a statutory maximum of only 10 years. And so really their guidelines turned, because their offense level is so high, this person actually was at a 43, which means life, but the stat max was only 10 years. So the guidelines were capped at 10 years and the judge gave, obviously imposed half the the 10 years or five years or six, 60 months. At any rate, so what I did to determine, uh, to compare him to similarly situated individuals, rather than focusing just on 2S1.1, 1.3, which was his guideline, I looked at everybody that had a total offense level of 38 in criminal history category one, that was not subject to any mandatory minimum because Mr. Manafort wasn't, and that could skew the data if somebody is. So I eliminated all of those individuals if they had a mandatory minimum or a mandatory consecutive uh, sentence uh, as part of their sentence. Uh, and uh, I also uh, made sure that the statutory maximum that they uh, were exposed to was at least 20 years. Now, Mr. Manafort's uh, statutory maximum was greater than 20 years, but nobody thought he would even get 20 years. So that's why I looked at those to try to get as much data as I possibly could. And so these individuals are going to call very similarly situated. Now, they're not identical. They're not identical because they have different 
guidelines. They, they got to a 38 criminal history one under different guidelines. Some of them may have been convicted of fraud offenses. Some of them could have been convicted of firearms offenses. A lot of them were convicted of drug offenses. But frankly, really, none of that matters under the guidelines because once you get that number, that total offense level, the guidelines don't care how you got there. Once you got that number, that's your sentencing range. So in my expert opinion, this is a very valid way of assessing Mr. Manafort's 47-month sentence. How does it stack up to others that had, except for the, the guideline, which really doesn't matter, that had the same total offense level, same criminal history category, no mandatory minimum, and were exposed to at least a 20-year stat max? That means the judge could have imposed up to 20 years or more, because there are many individuals in here that had much longer statutory maximum. Okay, so <clears throat> now explaining this table, 328, I found 328 of individuals, which is a pretty significant, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, universe. This isn't a sample size, this is everybody from 2006 to 2017 that meets these criteria. The average sentence imposed was 167 months. The median, 167.1 months, the median was 167 months. Um, now we have two, two categories here, two columns each. We have the 5K. 5K 1.1 is a motion for a downward variance for cooperation. It's actually something that Manafort had in D.C., in his D.C. case, and he blew it. He had a cooperation deal going, and the government, if he fully cooperated, was going to move under 5K 1.1 for a downward departure for what's called substantial assistance. But Manafort blew it, and he didn't get that. But nonetheless, it's good to, for us to see here what would somebody, if somebody like Manafort had cooperated, okay, and received a 5K 1.1, which means, by the way, they would have pled guilty, uh, or, or I mean, yeah, would have pled guilty. 99.9% .9 of these individuals obviously plead guilty. It's rare that they got a Manafort situation is rare where he goes to trial and gets tried again in another case and the pleads guilty to that and still eligible for a 5K. Very rare. Actually, I've never seen that before. So uh, usually in a 5K 1.1, they're not going to trial. They're pleading guilty. That's the whole point because they want to pro provide cooperation. So these people are, are people that did not go to trial, cooperated successfully with the government, and got a motion for a downward variance. And so look at, the, so there were 58 of these individuals that met this criteria and they got a 5K. Their average downward variance was only 133 months. The median was 138, okay? That's less than the 188 months that Manafort got, okay? So they, these are the cooperators that pled guilty. And actually they had, this might be getting a little bit too technical, but their offense conduct arguably was more serious than what, not arguably, actually it had to have been more serious than Mr. Manafort's for them to get an offense level 38. Uh, under the guidelines, if you plead guilty, you're eligible for a three level reduction. Uh, so they had to be, and everybody gets that, almost everybody gets it. Certainly everybody that's pleading guilty and has a cooperation agreement gets a three-level reduction for pleading guilty. So that means that they were really at a 41 and then got minus three to get to a 38. And Manafort was just a 38. Of course, he doesn't get any downward adjustment for, he didn't get any downward adjustment for acceptance of responsibility because he didn't. He went to trial. So with that said, these individuals who, can, uh, who ha had more serious conduct than Mr. Manafort but pled guilty and uh, uh, successfully cooperated, on average, they only received a 101-month sentence. And me the median was 97 months. Okay, so that is Manafort, Manafort got less than half of the sentence that on average a cooperator who has pled guilty receives. And these, are, and these individuals are getting significant downward variances. You know, that's uh, over 10 years, over 11, frankly, over 11 years. That's over 11 years off the bottom of the guideline range for their cooperation. That is significant. And yet, Mr. Manafort, with a 47-month sentence, got even less. Half. That is a significant finding. 
And I would think that any, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Virginia, as well as the special counsel, Mr. Mueller, is going to find this problematic. And because this is, a, this is a significant anomaly, if you will. Um, it's not unprecedented, though, and I'm going to talk about that here in a minute. Interestingly enough, it's not unprecedented, but nearly. Now, what the, this last column here, the downward variances, what these illustrate, what these show, are when a judge exercises his or her own authority to go below, to set, impose a sentence below the guideline range. In other words, this is not part of a cooperation deal. This is the judge just making his or her own assessment, like Judge Ellis did yesterday, that the guidelines are too high. They're, I think what Judge Ellis had actually said was the guidelines are out of whack. And frankly, they often are. Uh, so what we're discussing here isn't whether or not they're out of whack. It's, again, the degree of how out of whack they were as, a, as applied to Mr. Manafort. So there were 121 of these 328 individuals that received a downward variance. But their downward variance, and this is surprising, was still significant, 96.2 months on average, 91, point, 91 months uh, median, um, still significant, not quite as high as a 5K, and that's to be expected because the cooperators are doing more than just pleading guilty. And by the way, most of these individuals, not all of them, but most had, had pled guilty. Um, so it's not surprising anyway because of the, the cooperators generally get more credit uh, in, in terms of leniency than uh, just a defendant on their own without any cooperation. But these are defendants like Mr. Manafort that didn't get a cooperation agreement. Um, their average sentence was only 138, was 138 months, and their median was 12 years. So this is what, what these data, what these statistics show is just, again, how anomalous Mr. Manafort's 47-month sentence is. When it's half of what a cooperator receives, that should give, that sh certainly should give a court pause, certainly an appellate court pause, uh, and I think would be a significant grounds uh, for the for the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office to appeal the sentence, which they can, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But just uh, finishing up some statistical findings here. Only nine individuals, according to the commission's database, only nine that of similarly situated individuals, and again, these are the individuals that ha had a final offense level of 38, criminal history one, no mandatory minimum, at least a 20-year statutory maximum, okay, regardless of guideline. There were only nine that received a larger downward variance. But again, they were all under different guidelines. Under Mr. Manafort's guideline 2S1.3, he is far and away the largest downward variance. Unique in that, in that sense. Unprecedented. So there were nine similarly situated. I was able uh, to find one of these individuals. Unfortunately, the guideline or the sentencing commission, when it publishes its databases, or data files, it does not also publish the name of the defendant uh, in its data. So sometimes it's a little difficult, although we here at Sentencing Stats do have alternative methods where we can find uh, uh, particular uh, cases, the names of the defendants and judges and courts, et cetera, uh, in the data. Um, it just takes extra effort. But nonetheless, through our extra effort, I was able to find one of these nine just to get a comparison. In other words, what other types of cases of these nine that are like Mr. Manafort that received a significant downward variance and that had a final, final offense level of 38, what of these nine, what did they look like? And so here's one of them, uh, which happens to have been sentenced feet away from where Mr. Manafort was sentenced. This was also out of the Eastern District of Virginia back in 2015. Uh, and this was, uh, the sentence was not imposed by Judge Ellis, but by one of his colleagues there on the court, uh, Judge Brinkema, uh, who has had many high-profile uh, criminal cases over the last uh, several years. Uh, at any rate, this, this individual, Jeffrey Sterling, he received a 42-month sentence. Uh, he was sentenced for espionage, and his guidelines, like uh, Mr. Manafort's, were exactly the same. He was an offense level 38, which is approximately 19 to, to 24 years. He had also gone to trial, just like Manafort, and was you know, obviously found guilty, uh, but the judge, Judge Brinkema, in his case, 
uh, like Judge Ellis, decided to depart uh, significantly. Now, what Mr. Sterling did was he leaked classified information uh, to a New York Times reporter. Is that, you know, I will leave that up to the viewers or listeners uh, to determine whether um, these are co uh, comparable cases. I mean, arguably on its face, uh, the conduct that Mr. Manafort engaged in and some of the other ancillary conduct he's been accused of engaging in is far more serious than leaking classified information to a New York Times reporter, arguably. Now, I'm not completely familiar with the Jeffrey Sterling case. I'm not sure about the, uh, how serious the, this information was that was leaked and if it you know, resulted in the deaths of anybody or injuries or damage to our intelligence um, community. But again, even if it did, arguably what uh, Mr. Manafort engaged in and certainly what he's accused in an ancillary fashion in terms of Russian collusion and what have you of uh, being engaged in, that may be far more serious uh, and, and may not have warranted such a, uh, a large downward variance such as uh, what Mr. Sterling received. But nonetheless, I just provide this here for uh, the viewer to research independently if he or she desires. But at any rate, there's at least one of the nine for you. And so all, we're almost done going through some of the statistical findings. So um, a 47 month uh, sentence is still is far greater. And this I'm kind of switching gears here. Instead of showing how um, low it is statistically, which it is, uh, there's another way, as I mentioned at the beginning, that you can, t you can look at this using the, the data. A 47-month sentence, as it turns out, is still greater than what most economic offenders generally receive. And this is all types of white-collar crime, and not necessarily individuals that are sentenced under 2S1.3, and also you know, not necessarily individuals that have the same offense level. <laughs> this is including... Because most people, as it turns out, have far lower offense levels than what Mr. Manafort had. So, in a sense, this is not really a fair comparison. This is why here at Sentencing Stats, we like to focus on, when we're doing our statistical analysis, analyses, we focus on the offense level. That is so important. It's arguably, in our opinion, more important to look at the offense level that, he, that an individual is sentenced under than what guideline or the offense of conviction, because it's the offense level that drives the sentencing range, which in turn drives, is the starting point for the sentencing analysis uh, judges undertake. But nonetheless, now setting all that aside, uh, uh, all those uh, caveats, this is a comparison just of what the median and average sentences are in various offense categories uh, that defendants have received from 2006 to 2017. Uh, the, this uh, light orange bar here, that's Mr. Manafort's sentencing range for a final offense level of 38 criminal history category 1, the 235 to 293 months. So that gives you, you know, wh where the guidelines have suggested that he be sentenced. Now, arguably, uh, this is where the guidelines are perhaps ratcheted up too high. And, Mr. and Judge Ellis is uh, correct. And actually, I think they are ratcheted up too high. I agree with this. Because basically what the sentence, if he was sentenced within that range or even close to that range, it's basically what people get for producing child pornography. It's almost what they get for first degree murder. It's more than what they get on average, or generally speaking, for kidnapping and a lot more than criminal sexual abuse. So a, a guideline sentence really was absurd. Uh, frankly, and I think the Judge Ellis is easily defensive, can be easily defended, or his sentence can be easily defended in that regard as it, it, it being below the guidelines range, because the guidelines range really was too high. But now we turn to the degree, the degree of that downward variance. Is that justified? And just eyeballing it here, um, you know, a 47 month sentence still is greater than what most people get for fraud offenses. But again, we have to keep in mind that the, uh, the total offense level of most of these offenders are, is well below 38. I think it's like in the 20s or low 20s, uh, maybe even lower. So the offense levels, the typical offense levels for some of these lower, lower sentenced offenses are much lower too. 
But nonetheless, this gives you an idea where a 47-month sentence lies. It's about what one gets for aggravated assault. Now, is Mr. Manafort's offense conduct more serious than a typical aggravated assault? Perhaps. Uh, it's about what one gets for firearms. Uh, money laundering, now we're kind of getting in the area, but you can, you know, the point is just for comparative purposes, you can see what, uh, uh, from a 50,000 foot perspective, uh, what other offenders receive and where 47 months comes in. So now, uh, on balance, it appears, though, that this is, it's a unique sentence under, under the particular guideline, under 2S1.3. It's a nearly unique sentence, nearly unprecedented, when you look at just a, the final offense level or total offense level, I use those phrases interchangeably, of 38. Um, as I've gone through in the last half hour, that's a very significant downward variance uh, only nine individuals have received such a variance or greater. Uh, and I give you the example of Mr. Sterling from 2015. Uh, most individuals that are similarly situated to him receive much higher sentence, years, multiple years higher, sometimes decades higher or a decade higher than what he received, even those who cooperate and plead guilty. So arguably, this introduces unwarranted sentencing disparity, and that's something that the guidelines try to eliminate. The big things, and I kind of got off track when I was talking about the philosophy of the guidelines earlier, is similarly situated offenders ought to be treated similarly. It's a very obvious proposition, non-controversial. Um, and a corollary of that is judges need to avoid unwarranted sentencing disparity that even if you don't think that the guidelines, you think the guidelines might be ratcheted up too high or too low, as the case may be, you know, it's, it's important, this is where statistics come in, to see what other judges nationwide are sentencing people to. And this is, uh, there have been several appellate opinions uh, over the last several years from across the country that have emphasized this, the need to, have un, uh, to avoid unwarranted disparity and the importance of statistics. So the only way you can avoid it, frankly, is to have uh, this information at hand, and this is what we try to provide at Sentencing Stats, is this ability this, uh, to see what the general practices are in other jurisdictions across the country for similarly situated offenders. So you could try to avoid that unwarranted sentencing disparity and achieve the goal of uh, a uniformity in punishment. Uh, which is the similarly situated should receive similar sentences. When that doesn't happen, when that doesn't happen, either the defendant can appeal or the government can appeal, unless they've waived their rights to appeal, which generally only happens when somebody has entered a plea agreement, which we know hasn't happened here for this case. So Mr. Manafort can appeal. If he thinks 47 months is too, too high, he can appeal that sentence. Frankly, I think he'd be silly to. Uh, it'd be a waste of time. Uh, but also the government can appeal that sentence. And I think there's a high likelihood, given the nature of this sentence, and, and it's unprecedented from one perspective and nearly unprecedented nature from another perspective, of that sentence, I think the, the, the government here is likely to do that. And so let's look at the statistics now on appeals. So what this is, this is uh, from a Sentencing Commission report uh, that, that you can find online. Um, what this uh, reports is the total number of sentencing appeals. This isn't the total number of criminal appeals. Because, uh, for example, those defendants that go to trial and are convicted, they very often uh, appeal not just their sentence but also their conviction. And sometimes they only appeal the conviction. They don't really they may not be interested in appealing the sentence for whatever reason. So these, the, the, uh, these statistics are focused just on those, uh, just on those defendants that appe have appealed at least the sentencing portion of their case. They might also be appealing a conviction if that was relevant, but as 97% of federal uh, defendants plead guilty, most of these sentencing appeals are the result of a plea, that they pled guilty either open or they pled pursuant to a plea agreement. So at any rate, uh, 3,419 
defendants appealed their sentences in fiscal year 2017, which is the latest year that we have available, or at least that the commission has published. The affirmance rate is quite high. What the, affirm, the affirmed means is that the appellate court, wherever they appealed, said the sentence is fine. It passes muster. There is no legal error here. So we think what the sentence, the sentence is legal, so therefore we affirm. That's pretty high. So the, there's only, in other words, there's only a 30% chance that a defendant appealing his or her sentence is going to get any, uh, is going to get it reversed or remanded for a resentencing. So, and before I just leave that real quick, uh, even if a, a defendant gets his or her sentence reversed or remanded, that doesn't mean they're out of the woods. I've seen this happen frequently, go back for resentencing and the judge imposes the same sentence, but now may beef up the rationale for that sentence. Because very often, what, why a court might reverse a sentence is either there was an error in calculating the guidelines, in which case, regardless of what the sentence is, whether it's above, below, or within the guideline range, uh, the Supreme Court has said that is an error, that's a reversible error, and so the, the, um, the judge, the district court, must correct that. Or even if there's not an error under the guidelines, the, the sentence itself could still be substantively unreasonable, even if it's within the guideline range. Uh, a district court still must justify why that particular sentence, which, by the way, just to remind us all, that's why I'm so interested in this 47 months. Why 47 months? But at any rate, so uh, if, if there's no error in how the guidelines were calculated, then the, uh, a, an appellate court can say, look, there's a problem with this. You still haven't justified the sentence. Why this particular sentence? And did you consider these factors adequately, et cetera? So what an appellate court won't do is say, you need to impose... We think you should have imposed five years or six years or 20 years or what have you. Appellate courts never do that. That's not their job. That's for a district court. But what an appellate court will do is say, hey, uh, you need to justify that particular sentence better. So very often when it goes back down yeah, for resentencing, then the defendant uh, can end up with the same sentence. Not, not a worse sentence, but the same sentence, just the, the district court now has uh, provided more rationale for why that particular sentence. Occasionally, though, occasionally, though, they might find, the defendant might find some relief, and then on further consideration after remand, in light of what a, a appellate court says, the district court decides, you know what, you're right. I was too, too harsh the first time. I'm going to impose a lower sentence. That does, that does happen, but not very frequently. Um, and again, I seriously doubt uh, Mr. Manafort is going to appeal at least this sentence. We still have to, he still is looking at DC and we'll see what happens there. And I have an idea that I'll talk about in a second. But um, so for, for the time being, what this shows you is that if you're, if you're a defendant and you're appealing your sentence, more likely than not, it's going to be affirmed. And even if it isn't affirmed, you're not out of the woods necessarily. Uh, you can be, but not necessarily. And by the way, Mr. Manafort is in the Fourth Circuit. These are the, the, uh, the statistics from the Fourth Circuit in 2017. There were 364 individuals that appealed their sentences there. The affirmance rate is slightly under the national rate, you know, 62%, but still nearly two-thirds of the sen sentences appealed there were, uh, were affirmed when brought by the defendant. Now, this is going to be an eye-opener, this next slide for, for everybody. This is the rate of government appeals of sentences, okay? Just remind us, 2017, there were 3,419 appeals of sentences by defendants. Same year, there were only 21 by the government. Why? Why is actually a surprisingly easy answer. Why is because most of the time, the sentence that is imposed, the government is happy with. It's the defendant that's not going to be happy with the sentence most of the time. And it's going to have to be a really, what the government's going to have to consider, an outrageous sentence for the government to bother to appeal. 
And most of the time, the government's not going to appeal unless they're afraid it's going to set bad precedent if they don't. And this might, for the reasons I gave you, at least statistically earlier. This might be one of those times that such a significant downward variance uh, can be a problem. And why could it be a problem for the, for the government? Because now you get, I guarantee you, you have a lot of upset inmates uh, that have committed far less serious offenses and are serving far more time. So there's an unwarranted disparity there. And this case is going to be cited by every defense attorney in the United States now at any sentencing as justification for a downward de departure. If Manafort can get f more than 15 years off his sentence for what he did, then my client should as well. <laughs> so, and some judges might follow that. And it's just uh, because they got to avoid unwarranted sentencing disparity. So this, this is a big outlier out there that they may want to nip in the bud. So this might be one of those 21 cases, one of those 21 sentences that they decide to appeal. And when they do appeal, what you do is you don't look at the affirmance rate. The affirmance rate is when the government loses, <laughs> when they're appealing. Uh, affirmance rate is when the defendant loses, when the defendant appeals. Because here, they, obviously, the government's going to choose what it decides to appeal carefully because they could lose and then set the bad precedent in stone that they're trying to avoid. Uh, so here, only uh, four they only lost four out of those 21 appeals. So they rarely appeal, but when they do, they win four out of five times. They only lost in 19% uh, of the cases uh, that they, 19% uh, of the appeals or four of the appeals that they brought in 2017. So they win 80% of the times. The, the rare, when they appeal, they, they, they rarely appeal, but when they do, they win 80% of the time. So there's probably a good chance that they're going to do it this time because they're, it's likely they're going to appeal. And what's also interesting here in the Fourth Circuit, they didn't even bring any appeals because they generally agree. Well, obviously they agree with the sentences. That's why there's no appeals. Or they don't, just don't, they might not even agree with it, but they just don't think it's going to set a bad precedent or it's a problem or that it needs to be fixed on appeal. This, I think, is going to. I, I, I really do. I think that they're going to take a look at, at, at this. Uh, it may depend on what happens next, next week, but even so, regardless of what Judge Jackson does, they still may want to appeal this, this particular sentence. So, um, now with that said, uh, before I go on to Judge Jackson, just, just quickly, uh, for those of you who may be upset about a 47-month sentence, just keep in mind this. This is his life expectancy. Uh, he has you know, about 15 years left in his life expectancy under normal circumstances. Uh, I, I've been talking about this a lot, this particular study. I've talked to Dr. Patterson in the past about her study, what she found looking at inmates under long-term um, confinement is that on average, uh, long-term confinement reduces, uh, the, for every year inside long-term confinement, their life expectancy is reduced by two years. So just taking that at face value, uh, Mr. Manafort, basically, and I've said this before to many uh, reporters I've spoken to, is that he only has about five years left anyway, if he's going to sp spend all that time in prison. He, 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 statistically speaking, he'll last about another five years, and that's what this graph shows. So uh, around 2024, when he's about 75, is when he'll die. Uh, with a 47-month sentence, uh, with credit for good conduct, time as well as uh, the, the um, Bureau of Prisons recently because of the First Step Act is now releasing non-dangerous prisoners. Elderly generally constitutes that, especially if it's an elder, elderly person that committed a uh, economic offense. They're releasing them early uh, to like a halfway house or sometimes home detention uh, in addition to the good conduct credit uh, that they receive. So at a 47 month sentence, Roughly speaking, I think he's only going to do about three years in. So uh, e even with this reduction in life expectancy, he sh he, if things don't get worse for him, and he's already in bad health, but if things don't get worse for him, statistically speaking, there's an end. Uh, he, he's, not, he, he's not necessarily going to die in prison. This isn't necessarily a life sentence. And that, frankly, is, I think, what Judge uh, Ellis was trying to achieve as well, too. I'm not sure if he said that. I haven't read 
any reports on that yet. Again, I, want, I haven't read the sentencing transcript. But, you know, this, that is a fair consideration. It's very expensive to house elderly inmates, especially long-term, is what we're going to have to do with Mr. Manafort. Uh, and the health care that they get in there, obviously, is not going to be top-notch. It may be barely suitable, and very often it isn't. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, Judge Ellis can take that into consideration. I've argued in the past that he should take that into consideration when he was imposing sentences. Uh, whether this is a de facto life sentence. Um, obviously, if uh, Mr. Manafort was a much younger man, uh, you know, a 12, 15-year sentence wouldn't, wouldn't be a life sentence. But obviously, as I've said, statistically speaking, any sentence greater than five years would have been statistically a life sentence for him. So all things being equal, maybe Judge Ellis was thinking, you know, but for his age, this wouldn't be a, a significant sentence, wouldn't be a life sentence, so I'm going to still give him a significant sentence that's going to still take up most of his remaining life expectancy, but not all of it. So he at least he has something to look forward to. At least that's a possible rationale that uh, if I was Judge Ellis, I certainly would have uh, ar articulated. But all that may be academic. And finally, we're coming to D.C. Judge Amy Berman Jackson, a former sentencing commissioner, I guarantee you, is going to be very attuned to the problems of unwarranted sentencing disparity because she used to be a commissioner at the agency whose job it is to try to avoid doing that. She is going to be very attuned to that uh, next week when she imposes a sentence on Mr. Manafort. Um, and she's well aware of what he received last night, this 47-month sentence. So <clears throat> what she can do First of all, she, as, as, as widely reported, and it's correct, she cannot impose a sentence greater than 10 years. She can impose anything from time served up to 10 years and no more. And so the guidelines, the guidelines as it turns out, are way above. They're about roughly what he received uh, in uh, the Eastern District of Virginia. As a matter of fact, they're a little bit higher now because he's going to be in criminal history category two, not one. Uh, he's now a recidivist. <laughs> he has a criminal history when he goes to see uh, to be sentenced in front of Judge Jackson next week. But the guidelines are very, very high, even higher than they are in the Eastern District of Virginia. But that doesn't really matter because they, the statutory maximum trumps that. So 10 years is all she can sentence him to. My, my educated guess is in light of Mr. Manafort's conduct, that the fact that he had his bail revoked by her, the fact that she found that he breached his plea agreement and cooperation agreement, uh, you know, and, and there have been other, other issues. Uh, she's going to throw the book at him as best she can and give him that 10-year sentence. Uh, because she's going to have to send a strong message here that his, his, both his offense conduct and his post-arrest conduct while awaiting sentencing cannot be tolerated. So that gives her 120 months. So I'm going to assume for our analysis uh, that she's going to impose this 120-month sen sentence. And so that, and that raises the question, consecutive or concurrent? She can do fully concurrent, fully consecutive, or a combination of the two. And this is basically what concurrent means is that the, both sentences, here's the Virginia sentence of 47 months, here's the D.C. sentence of 10 years or 120 months, side by side, they're served at the same time. So basically, if you will, the Virginia sentence, uh, Mr. Manafort gets for free because he's gonna be doing the same 47 months over here towards the 120 months that Judge Jackson's gonna give him. And by the way, this is going to be a life sentence for him. He will not survive this sentence unless he's pardoned or there's compassionate release or something like that. Uh, but setting aside those unlikely scenarios, uh, he will die, and this is an effective life, uh, life term for him as I why, for the reasons I previously explained. So here is his con this, this would be a concurrent scenario, uh, and this is a consecutive scenario where she just stacks on top. Now, she could have a little bit of overlap here if she wants to, but I think if she's going to go, I mean, obviously, obviously part of this is going to have to be consecutive. This part, anything over 47 months is obviously consecutive too, just mathematics. Um, but uh, I think she's going to go fully consecutive, and here's why. Uh, one of the, well, 
one of the reasons is to achieve a sentence that is sufficiently serious to match his conduct and also to try to avoid unwarranted sentencing disparity. So speaking of sentencing disparity, let's go back here and look at something. I discussed this earlier, but this, this is a visualization of it. Remember those, uh, those 328 individuals I talked about that were at offense level 38, even though I think he might be a higher offense level in DC and he's certainly not in criminal history category one. But let's just assume that this is the, the, the operative universe that he's still in for purposes of sentencing. Offense level 38, criminal history category one, no mandatory minimum, statutory maximum of at least 20 years, okay? 328 of those individuals. What this graph shows is the sentencing distribution for those individuals. Uh, the, shows that there have been some individuals that received no time, uh, and I think those were cooperators, uh, all the way up to 420 months. As a matter of fact, there have been some individuals that received higher sentences, but they're statistical anomalies, so I didn't include them here. But uh, all the way up to four, basically the, the range is 420 to zero months. But the bulk of the, the, bulk of the sentences fell between 97.8 months and 235 months. And again, this is the, the, um, the criteria for these 328 uh, individuals. Some of these individuals re received downward variances, some um, 5Ks, some within guidelines, and some above the guidelines. And the, this 235 months is the bottom of the guideline range. By the way, this is the uh, third quartile. This is the first quartile for the stat statisticians out here. And here's the median, 167 months. The average is 167.1 months. So if Judge Jackson is trying to achieve what, roughly speaking, the typical sentence for somebody nearly identically situated to Mr. Manafort, at least identically, what I would argue is identically situated in all relevant aspects, final offense level 38, criminal history one, no mandatory minimum, statutory maximum of at least 20 years. Guide, what guideline he was sentenced under doesn't matter at this point because he's already in the sentencing table. So those individuals, they typically receive anywhere from the bottom of the range to 97.8 months. And it just so happens that 167 months, 167.1 months is exactly the average. And that is what she can achieve by stacking. And in some weird world, maybe that's what Judge Ellis was thinking but she would be eminently justified in stacking, imposing her 10-year sentence fully consecutive to Mr. Manafort's 47-month sentence because that falls well within the range of what a typical defendant receives who is basically identically situated to Mr. Manafort. And that is achieving the purposes of the sentencing guidelines. So with that, uh, I am Mark Allenbaugh. We will uh, wait to see what happens on uh, next week in front of Judge Jackson. I will follow up with another sentencing analysis, uh, post-mortem, so to speak. Thank you very much.